I thought uh, to clarify this, and by the way, two people that have been granted some degree of uh, commutation clemency at this point are from Utah. And I thought, who better to talk to than Paul Cassell, a former U.S. Uh, federal judge and professor of law, University of Utah. And we often turn to Paul when we have some uh, questions on these. Paul, thank you for joining us. And have you had anything to do with either of the Utah cases? Well, uh, one of them was a uh, person that I sentenced to a mandatory life term, Joe Alvarado, whose sentence was commuted yesterday by President Obama was somebody that I sentenced uh, back in 2004. And that was a mandatory sentence? That was. It was mandatory life in prison. I had no discretion at all in that case. Uh, He had been convicted. He was a repeat drug dealer, a low-level drug dealer, uh, and on his last uh, drug deal involving a very, very dangerous drug, methamphetamine, he carried a gun to that uh, that drug deal. And so under the laws that existed in 2004 and, and still exist today, I was required to give him a life sentence. As you reflect back on that, uh, and and two questions are kind of embedded here, how do you feel about what has uh, transpired, and did you have reservations and concerns about that mandatory sentence so many years ago? I did have uh, concerns, because anytime you're giving somebody a life sentence, uh, there are two uh, costs, if you will. One is, of course, the cost to the prisoner. I mean, that meant Joe Alvarado was never going to set foot outside of prison if he had uh, served the full term. But the other concern I always had in the back of my mind was for the taxpayer. If we could lock up a fellow like Joe Alvarado for, I think he's 62 now, you know, we can keep him in prison another 10 years, 20 years. It costs $30,000 a year. So uh, you're looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Actually, the cost starts to escalate when you talk about elderly prisoners because you have medical costs in addition to the, the security costs that are involved. So I really was wondering at the time and and wonder today whether we were getting enough bang for our buck, if you will, with that kind of a long sentence. The thing I always think about, and as you know, I have no background in the law. I I have not studied the law. I have nothing, you know, compared to the engagement of just your rank-and-file lawyer that is out there. But it strikes me, just based on, on what I do witness, what I do report on, what we do talk about on this radio program, that people who have done a whole lot more than Joe Alvarado end up with, you know, much, much less. I mean, somebody who even killed somebody has a chance of getting out of jail. Somebody that has raped somebody, somebody that has really done some heinous things, don't face life in prison. I think you're exactly right on that, Doug. I mean, statisticians have said, all right, let's assume you commit a homicide in this country. What's your expected prison sentence? And, and you know, depending on how you define homicide and whether you put in just first-degree murders or, you know, or a broader range of, of homicides, you can get differing sentences. But it's something like, I don't know, seven to eight years is a standard figure. So now you compare that to Alvarado's life sentence. I mean, it's just completely disproportionate. And uh, as someone who's been deeply involved in the crime victims' rights movement, I try to draw a real line between violent acts that have directly harmed a particular person. You were putting your finger on things like rape and kidnapping, aggravated assault. I mean, those folks that commit those directly violent acts aren't getting mandatory life sentences. And so what kind of a message does that send to victims of crime when they see you know, a drug dealer getting a, a sentence that's orders of magnitude different uh, from from the sentence that their uh, their abusers have got. I remember so many years ago having two parents on the air with me, and this is a long time ago. We were still in our studios upstairs. It was when a lot of this mandatory stuff was still relatively fresh and very, very close in the rearview mirror. And I remember these folks came in and they talked to me, Paul, and they said, you know, we're not here to defend our son necessarily on the crime. He's overall a pretty good kid. He was looking at going on an LDS mission, but he did have certain drugs on. They were over a certain amount. He was selling those drugs to a friend. He was, you know, and I can't remember all the details, but it just barely, barely, barely got into that mandatory thing. This kid was a good student. He had never done anything else. He had never been arrested for anything else in his life. Uh, He was planning, as I mentioned, for an LDS mission. And 10 years, 10 years. And his folks said, look, did he deserve punishment? Absolutely. Was he guilty? Yes, he was. 
would we support him getting no punishment? No way. But 10 years, Paul, that has haunted me. Well, the the 10 year number that you mentioned, interestingly enough, that's one of the things that President Obama has taken into account. I think the lead into this segment was mentioning, you know, tens of thousands of prisoners out there. President Obama has said that his criteria for granting commutations include uh, situations where the prisoner has already served 10 years. Alvarado, I think, is about, I don't know, 12 or 13 years into a sentence. So when you're looking at people that have already served 10 years in prison, again, I'm really wondering, are we getting a lot of bang for our buck? Most folks that have studied uh, criminal sentencing says, look, the first couple of years, yeah, you're going to send a message then, but the the 10th year, the 12th year, the 14th year, I'm not so sure we're really getting a lot of uh, return on our investment. Right. We we are talking with former U.S. District Judge Paul Cassell, a professor of law at the University of uh, Utah, so much expertise, and we always tap into him when we have some of these questions. When we come back, I'd like to talk about the overall goal here. I'd like to talk about the the method in the uh, in in the process and what is hoped to be accomplished. And again, you know, some people are grinding on both sides of the political aisle on this, but the there is a a wide swath bipartisan group of individuals, Republicans, Democrats, independents, everything else that have been talking about this. And in these commutations, what is the ultimate goal? What is the criteria? What would be seriously considered? We'll continue that conversation. Paul Cassell, a former U.S. federal judge in Utah, professor of law at the University of Utah, is on the line with us. What is the goal here? And we're not in any of the territory that I just mentioned, are we? Because there have been some real controversial commutations and pardons over the years. You're exactly right, Doug. And and one of the things I want to give a a great deal of credit here to President Obama About a year ago, he announced, I think it was five or six criteria for commutations. He said, look, I'm interested in people that have served at least 10 years. They have a nonviolent crime. They would be serving less time if convicted for the crime today than when they were sentenced uh, earlier. And so he announced a set of criteria and then started to search for people that would meet those criteria. I think you mentioned, uh, for example, President Bill Clinton. That that seemed to be a different uh, approach entirely. It seemed to be more frankly, payola or political contacts or, or whatever it was. I and mean, on the last day out of office, he uh, pardoned or commuted several hundred sentences. Yeah, it really was long. last day, kind of middle of the night type stuff that really, really had a bad feel to it. It did. And, uh, you know, President uh, Obama, again, to his credit, has done this, you know, before the election. And if, if people think this is an inappropriate way to proceed, they'll have a chance to to vote on on two candidates or more that uh, may have a different approach to those kinds of issues. And so I think uh, this is the way the system is supposed to work. There's supposed to be a process. There is actually an office in the Justice Department, the Office of Pardon Attorney, that reviews applications and and then makes a recommendation to the president. And as I say, he has a a checklist of things he's looking for. The fellow we've been talking about, Joe Alvarado, uh, was a drug dealer. He did carry a gun to a drug deal, but never deployed it or used it as far as I'm aware. And, and so he falls into a different category than uh, than someone else. And so you can say, all right, this is a case for prioritizing his commutation and, and you know, somebody else who shot someone or whatever. Well, all right, let's, uh, let's leave them in prison and, and put them on the back burner. Right. Is this clemency issue exclusively aimed at, targeted at those uh, who primarily did drug deals? Are, are other things included here? Well, it could be other things, but drug deal is, drug dealing is sort of the paradigmatic case for, uh, as you were saying, you know, excesses in the federal system. Let's be clear. I would say that most people would agree that, I don't know, 80, 90, maybe even more percent of the sentences in the federal court are, are fair. But we're now in the, the 1% to 2% range where we have somebody who hasn't committed a direct act of personal violence against someone, and yet they're serving, as in Alvarado's case, a mandatory life sentence. Well, that raises a lot of questions, and that's the the kind of case where I think we need a fail-safe, if you will, in the system. And I think the president's commutation power is uh, is exactly that kind of a safety valve to make sure that... uh, when you get these excessive sentences, something can be done. So those that have already served a 10-year, those who are nonviolent, those who under today's uh, attitudes and guidelines would uh, spend less time in jail, 
primarily, but not necessarily exclusively drug-related. Is race playing into this? Paul, as you well know, so many times the, the disproportionate number of people of color who end up in jail way out of uh, proportion. And uh, even when you weigh in socioeconomic factors, neighborhoods, opportunity, job opportunities, it, it still is way out of whack. Are they getting uh, higher priority? I don't think they're getting higher priority. Race certainly hasn't been one of the criteria that President Obama has announced. But the, as a practical matter, when you talk about drug dealers who are locked up in federal prison, uh, they disproportionately, compared to the overall population, involve racial minorities. And so you're seeing, uh, you know, I, I don't recall exactly uh, some of the, the statistics, but you're going to see a larger number of African-American and Hispanic offenders who are on this list than you would find find elsewhere. And, and again, one of the reasons I've been involved in something like this is I think it gives the federal criminal justice system a bad rap when people look at, hey, this drug dealer's getting a mandatory life sentence. What's what's going on? I think we need to get rid of those excessive sentences. So then the run-of-the-mill, the day-to-day kind of case where someone is getting a long sentence for committing a serious act of violence or a terroristic kind of crime, uh, those uh, sentences are viewed as, as fair and, and proportionate by the general population. I was reading where uh, President Obama signed the letters to recipients explaining uh, basically why they were even uh, remotely being considered here. And he said uh, they should consider turning their lives around, and by doing so, you will affect not only your own life, I'm quoting now, but those close to you. You will also influence, through your example, the possibility that others in your circumstances can get their own second chance in the future. I believe in your ability to prove the doubters wrong, so good luck and Godspeed. You know, there are doubters, even though this has across-the-board bipartisan support, it may not be overwhelming. There are still those that doubt. There are still some of the hardliners who believe one of the reasons that uh, crime rates are down in the country. I know based on the headlines, sometimes that's hard to believe, but overall they are down in our country. And they're saying, yeah, that's because we are so darn tough. Is there the possibility for a backlash? This carries some political risk, does it not? A, A Willie Horton situation or something? That's right. I mean, any time a president commutes 200 sentences, well, you got to expect that you know one or more of those 200 people. Uh, they're, these are generally uh, criminal people that have certainly been convicted of a serious crime, and the risk that they're going to return to a life of crime is there. For me, the main question is: Could we get more bang for our buck? I mean, take those 200 people. If we lock them up uh, for another 10, 20 years, you're talking about millions of dollars. If we release those people and take those millions of dollars, we can spend them in other ways. And and people may disagree about that. There might be some who would say, well, I want drug rehabilitation. There may be others who argue for cops on the street. There may be others who argue for more prisons or more prosecutors. But certainly I think we can take that money and invest it more widely, uh, wisely than investing it in you know, locking up a guy like Joe Alvarado for 10, 20, 30 years. That just isn't a, a wise use of, of, of scarce resources. We've had several people who have texted in and uh, have agreed with you, and they said, you know, as these prisoners do get older, first of all, is there anything being accomplished with them and for society that is productive at that point? And they have alluded to the cost, not just the cost of basically warehousing a person, but as they do get older, we know that the skyrocketing costs of their health care. There are just so many things at play here. But boy, a lot of people took what you said there to heart, Paul. Well, yeah, that's one of the things. When you, Joe Alvarado, I think, is 62 years old. One of the interesting things about his case is that President Obama commuted his sentence but conditioned it on Alvarado completing a two-year drug rehabilitation program while in prison. And I think that's an important thing. It's not just a question of how long are we going to lock something up. It's what kind of transitional measures are we going to put in place to help get them back into the community, get them employed again, get them away from maybe their prior associates, you know, gang members or whoever it may have been that were were leading them down nonproductive paths. And so 
again, we can lock people up. That's just a question of dollars. But we can also think about transitioning back into the community where they'll become gainfully employed, hopefully. And that's just a, that's just a, a smart, common-sense measure all the way around. Absolutely. Paul, thank you for sharing your time with us again here on the Doug Wright Show at KSL News Radio. Uh, Paul Cassell, former U.S. Uh, federal judge. Boy, talk about some expertise in this area. And he even sentenced one of the individuals that we have mentioned, Joe Alvarado, to uh, a life sentence that now has been commuted with conditions from President Obama.